Hello, and welcome to Third Thursday at Hoover's, and thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Jerry Flegel, President and CEO of the Hoover Presidential Foundation. Before I start the program, I'd like to share some upcoming events with you. Our next Third Thursday event features author and historian Paul Jewell, who will discuss his latest research and book, and you'll find all the details and a registration link on our website at hooverpresidentialfoundation.org. If you're a fan of uh, when, wanting to know more about when Herbert Hoover came back to Eastern Iowa, this is gonna be the program for you. You're gonna find it very interesting. Our biggest news is about our annual celebration banquet. We're close to selling out for the event, which will be held Friday, October 7th at the Doubletree by Hilton in Cedar Rapids. We needed a big space as there was a lot of people who wanna come and hear our featured speaker. President George W. Bush. If you haven't purchased your tickets yet, you can do so right after the program as ticket sales end on Tuesday, September 20th. You can get all the details and purchase tickets or even tables if you like from our website, hooverpresidentialfoundation.org. And of course, there's lots of other things to see and do on the Hoover campus. So drop by anytime. The museum is open seven days a week from nine to five as well as the National Historic Site and the historic buildings there. I hope you'll come by and visit us soon with your whole family. Also on our website, you can learn about a major fundraising campaign for the renovation of the Hoover Presidential Library and Museum. It's been 30 years since the last renovation and we're excited about bringing new technology and other updates into the museum. We have a special benefit for Iowa taxpayers who contribute to the Timeless Values campaign, where you can earn a 25% Iowa State tax credit for your gift of any size, no matter how much or how small the gift is. As of tonight's program, I encourage you to enter any questions you have for Cindy in the Q&A link on the edge of your screen. You can even vote for someone else's question if it's of interest to you, as questions with more votes tend to get asked first. And we've got a big crowd on hand tonight, so I imagine there's going to be a lot of questions. So uh, 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 get them in early and vote for your favorite ones. Also, please respect our copyright and do not record this session yourself. It will be available on uh, the Hoover Presidential Foundation YouTube channel if you are interested, but please do not record it tonight. The Hoover archives contain a collection of papers from Laura Ingalls Wilder, and each year, we devote a third Thursday program on that subject. Tonight, author and historian Cindy Wilson will present How the Hard Winner of 1880 Became the Long Winner by Laura Ingalls Wilder. And we'll take your questions at the end of the program. Just use that Q&A feature I mentioned earlier. I'm pleased to welcome author Cindy Wilson to the program. Cindy is passionate about history and enchanted by the prairie landscape. Her award-winning book, the Beautiful Snow, The Ingalls Family, The Railroads, and The Hard Winter of 1880-81 can be purchased through our website, thebeautifulsnow.com, or at various online and museum retailers. Cindy, welcome to Third Thursday here at Hoover's. Well, thank you very much. I am going to quick share my screen here. So again, thank you, Jerry. And Thank you very much to the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum and the Hoover Presidential Foundation for inviting me to be a part of the third Thursday programming. And I also want to thank the professional, friendly, helpful, and wonderful research library staff there. I spent many days in the library with the Rose Wilder Lane and Laura Ingalls Wilder's paper collection, and it is just an absolutely wonderful treasure trove of information. So for this talk, I'm going to take a look at, I'm going to begin with a look at the history behind the hard winter of 1880-81 as found in the newspaper records, including some context for Laura Ingalls Wilder's novel, The Long Winter. Then we'll transition to some of the struggles that Wilder experienced while she was working on the novel, which takes place in the new town of DeSmet, Dakota Territory. It was Wilder's experiences during that historically awful winter that inspired her to include those months as an entire book within the Little House series. 
Generally, the other books cover from one to four years worth of time, and this one covers just eight months, yet is still one of the longer books of the series. So let's start with a little bit of the history behind The Hard Winter itself. I wanted to know how the novel compared to the historic record. Some histories, even those written just a few years after the winter had ended, had already begun to look at the history or the winter with nostalgia or to mythologize it, calling it a single very long blizzard, for instance, which of course it was not. So I turned to the information that was available at the time, week by week, as the winter unfolded. And the newspapers of the time are as close as we can come to knowing what it was really like Though there are some complications with that. Maybe somebody will remember to, at the end, ask what those complications were and we can circle back. I collected several thousand newspaper articles from close to 50 towns across Southern Minnesota and Eastern South Dakota. And before we jump completely into the history, let's set a little bit of context for how the winter was portrayed in the novel. The book began with a scene where young Laura is helping her pa cut hay. It's hot and humid, and you can almost feel how uncomfortable it was. Then that blizzard hit in mid-October. Cattle's breath froze their heads to the ground. It turned very cold. Fuel began to run low. The trains couldn't get through. Then the mail had to be brought into town via relay team. Then a big storm hit right after Christmas. Food began to run low and the blizzards kept coming one after another after another. Then finally in early May, a train was able to make it back. But that train wasn't carrying the desperately needed food. It brought farm equipment. Each of the things that I just mentioned from the novel are found in the newspaper record. But there are also things in the novel that don't quite line up with what was found in the articles. So let's now go back to the historic part. This map shows the region and the five primary railroad lines that I focused on. Dismet is on the left side of the screen where that star is. Many of the towns west of this line, like Dismet, were brand new. Most were less than a year old and a good percentage of them were less than six months old when that first blizzard hit. Each town was so new that people were still getting to know each other. They were still getting their sense of community established. They were still building their buildings. And those towns were especially dependent on the trains coming in for food and for fuel. The gray boxes on this map show the areas along each of the rail lines where the snow blockades became most problematic. There were hundreds of bad spots throughout the region. These were just the locations that were catastrophic. By mid-January, the areas affected by the small gray boxes on this screen looked like this. The weather was most definitely terrible that winter very similar to the novel. This photograph was taken just days after that first blizzard in St. James, Minnesota, about 150 miles to the south and east of Desmet. In fact, that storm had impacts as far east as the Lake Michigan area. Take a good look at the photo and how the snow was drifted up against and between and under the cars and somebody left the doors open. So if you look closely on the right side, you can see that snow drifted into those cars as well. And think about the process of having to shovel all of that snow away from the cars so that they could be moved again. And this was just one rail yard among dozens along one of the rail lines after the very first blizzard, which started with bare ground. The weather was mostly mild over the next two months. There were several snowstorms, but overall it was dry enough that prairie fires became a problem. Then the day after Christmas, one of the winter's biggest storms hit and set in motion the ongoing problems. About that 
Christmas blizzard, the Brookings County Press wrote, Sunday was a terror. It snowed and it blowed and it drifted until it seemed as though the whole country was to be inundated. And the next three and a half months suffered many similar storms. In mid-April, a newspaper in New Ulm, Minnesota, noted that according to the records kept at Fort Snelling, the snowfall this winter has been four times as great as for the previous nine years and nine times the average of 19 years. And this data gathering happened before the final snowstorm of the winter. So imagine how much snow had fallen and how it would block the tracks. And we'll talk about that aspect in a few moments, but before we do, Remember that in the novel, the first train into Desmet carried farm equipment, not food. A newspaper in Lake Benton, Minnesota, about 60 miles to the east of Desmet along the same railroad line, also complained that the first train in brought farm machinery, not food. Timing wise, this may be the exact same train that upset the people in Desmet. So many of the events that happened in the novel can be correlated at one time or another over the winter as having happened at least somewhere to someone. But there were also differences. For instance, in most places, food didn't really become truly low until the last month or so of the winter. There was definitely hunger, but not at widespread starvation levels. In many of the towns, social activities like school and parties continued to take place most of the winter despite the storms and people found ways to travel great distances, but this was often by walking. The biggest difference, however, between the novel and the historic record is how the railroad company was portrayed in the novel. Wilder felt deep anger towards the railroad company in her autobiography, she wrote, unreasonable as it was, I think no one who was there at the time could ever feel kindly toward a railroad company. In the novel, the railroad company gave up trying to clear the tracks and abandoned everyone west of Tracy to the blizzards. This was when Pa shared that fabulous story of the superintendent who came out to the Tracy cut to oversee work to clear the snow. After working all day to try and clear the tracks, a storm came through overnight and undid all of their hard work. And the superintendent stopped until spring. The Tracy Cut played an important role in the novel, being the location that blocked the trains. But what exactly is a cut? Let's look at one from ground level. Simply, a cut is where a hill existed, but the railroad company wanted to go straight through the hill, not up and over it. So the crew cut out the hill to allow the tracks to go through. The problem was that those early cuts were very, very narrow. And snow, rather than blowing over the top of these cuts, would blow into the cut, swirl around and get trapped, then settle, compact, and form into ice. According to the newspaper record, the railroad companies all across the region kept working all winter, trying to clear the tracks and trying to beat the blizzards. They also tried to help the towns to the west of the blockades. The railroad company even gave out coal for free in Desmet after that first October storm. And over the course of the winter, railroad agents in many of the towns were authorized to sell the railroad's coal or unused ties at cost so the people could burn them for heat. Some agents were even kind enough to give those items away for free. Throughout the winter, people also pulled up railroad ties and cut up railroad bridges and trestles to burn for heat. And those repairs also had to be made before the trains were able to safely run even after the snow and the ice had been taken care of. There were thousands of men and probably tens of thousands of man hours spent shoveling and trying to get the trains through. They'd almost get the tracks cleared and another blizzard would hit just like in the superintendent story. But unlike the superintendent story, the railroad companies never did give up. In January, the Volga Gazette shared 
that it seems to be an impossibility to keep the road open between Sleepy Eye and Tracy. They no sooner get a train through when along comes another blizzard and fills up the cuts again. The railroad company are doing all any human power can do to keep the road clear. So let's look at some photos that show exactly why it was so hard to get the trains moving. I mean, just look at how deep the snow was. And even when they could get the track shoveled out, they were narrow and icy. And as rough as the photo on the right looks, this is an area where they were at least able to keep the trains moving. In the novel, Pa does a, a description of how the men had to shovel the snow up and up. And this is what he was talking about. The men at the bottom would shovel the snow up as high as they could reach. Then the men at that level would shovel the snow up as high as they could reach and so on until they could finally toss the snow most of the snow shoveling or most of the snow clearing work was done by shovelers. Think about how much work that was and how they were burning a lot of calories and not able to replenish their energy as much as they should. And if you look close left, you can see shovelers at the track level as far back towards the horizon as you can see. This photo from a different location shows a block of snow after a locomotive had backed it out of the cut. Then they just tipped those blocks of snow off to the side of the tracks. And then they went in and got another block of snow and another block and another block until the cut was finally cleared of snow. Another difference between the novel and history though minor really, is that the problem in real life wasn't at the Tracy cut. It was 45 miles further east of Tracy at Sleepy Eye. The trains couldn't get very far west of Sleepy Eye most of the winter. So it is possible that work was stopped at the Tracy cut, but it didn't really matter because trains couldn't get to Tracy in the first place. However, I didn't find a lot in the newspaper record to indicate whether work was or was not going on to the immediate west of Tracy once the blockades really settled in, aside from one article in late May March that did indicate that there had been a work stoppage. After the final blizzard in mid-April, the Janesville, Minnesota Argus wrote, 800 men are now engaged in opening the Winona and St. Peter Railroad west of Sleepy Eye. At latest accounts, only a few miles had been cleared. Ice two feet in thickness on top of the rails is found in places. No snowplow could buck such a drift. Warm weather alone is likely to take out such ice banks. Imagine 800 people and they were not making a whole lot of progress yet. This is one of my favorite photos of the winter for showing just how deep that snow was and what the railroad companies were up against. This photo was taken west to Sleepy Eye in late March and shows the culprit uh, behind the deprivation suffered by DeSmet and the other towns west along two of the five railroad lines I studied in the book. In a reminiscence written decades later, one old timer from DeSmet wrote, to have been a South Dakota pioneer, one must be able to tell of experiences during the hard winter. And that brings us back to Laura Ingalls Wilder. Now that we've seen a little bit about what period newspapers and photographs show us about the winter, let's turn to how Wilder took her memories and experiences and turned them into her novel, The Long Winter. By reading her autobiography, which was published as the book Pioneer Girl in 2014, we can see that Wilder remembered the winter a certain way. Not everything she remembered was put into the novel and not everything in the novel was in the autobiography, which she wrote just before the Little House series was begun. And not everything she remembers, she remembered lines up with what can be found in the newspaper record. Similarly, not everything in the novel was nor needed to be factual. 
It is fiction after all. She was going for a true story, which it was, and remember that truth and fact are different things. Wilder's daughter, Rose Wilder Lane, was an internationally known writer and editor. And it was her connections and editing skills that helped Wilder mold her writing and get the books published. The Long Winter is the sixth book in the Little House series. By examining the autobiography, manuscripts, and letters between the two women, we can see the evolution between Wilder's memories and the published novel. In early 1938, Wilder and Lane were still heavily at work on the book by the shores of Silver Lake, the fifth book in the Little House series. Most of Wilder's heavy writing was done for Silver Lake, so she was beginning to think about the next book, which would be about the hard winter. But she was also thinking ahead to what was originally planned to be one final book to finish the series. Laura wrote to Rose, I have the chapters of the hard winter blocked out a good deal as you suggest, even to Pa going hunting and not getting any game, which was true. She was thinking about those details that would fill out the story beyond just the blizzards and the hunger and the cold. But four days later, after trying to establish a plot line for the book, she again wrote to Rose. Here is what is bothering me and holding me up. I can't seem to find a plot or a pattern as you call it. There seems to be nothing to it, only the struggle to live through the winter until spring comes again. This of course they all did, but is it strong enough or can it be made strong enough to supply the necessary thread running all through the book? Wilder was struggling with how to expand the story enough to be an entire novel. Could nonstop snow, cold, and hunger really evolve into a full story that anybody would want to read? Frequently, Wilder used her letters to Rose to hash out ideas. In this letter, she was working on a scene where a blizzard struck the school while students were in class. One of the main characters for this book is her future husband, El Manzo, or as she called him, Manly. And she was thinking about how to introduce him into the storyline. She originally plans to have El Manzo be the person who came to the school to escort Miss, Teach, Miss Garland, the teacher, and the students home when the blizzard hit during a school day. She wrote to Lane, Laura and El Manzo are to meet when the blizzard closes the school. You remember when the school wouldn't follow Cap Garland and nearly got lost? I don't know how it will work out, but I'm going to have Laura go with El Manzo to town. Here we can see Wilder, the storyteller, working out possibilities. In her autobiography, it was Mr. Holmes, not El Manzo, who helped them get back home. In the novel, she had it be Mr. Foster to limit the number of characters as Mr. Foster was already um, playing a role in the novel. And as ultimately resolved in the published novel, Laura gets her first glimpse of El Manzo not while he is rescuing the school children from the blizzard, but while he and his brother Royal were cutting hay just like her pa was. In fact, rather than making his appearance in a heroic episode, we meet El Manzo as he's lounging on top of a giant pile of hay and his brother Royal is pleading with him to please work harder. Remember, as just mentioned, Wilder and Lane were also at this point hard at work perfecting by the shores of Silver Lake. So Wilder's focus was not entirely on the winter yet. And before working too hard on the story about the winter, she wanted to block out the remainder of the Little House series up to when she and Almanzo marry and the series ends. She originally intended there to be one final book after the hard winter story. The one final novel was eventually split into two books, Little Town on the Prairie and These Happy Golden Years. While working to block out the story arc for the hard winter, she had to make sure that what she planned to do in the final book would work well within the hard winter story too. In one letter, Wilder wrestled with the character Laura's future need to teach, her young age, 
and going to school herself and how all of that would need to resolve by the end of the series. She toyed with this idea and then that idea, trying to find a workable trajectory. Then in frustration, she circled back within her letter to Rose to say that everything she had just thought through seems to weaken it, to be a sort of anti-climax after the hard winter. I don't like it. But then that reminded her of the needed plot for the winter book. So then she added, but where is the plot in the hard winter? Over the next year or so, the two women finished the details for By the Shores of Silver Lake while simultaneously putting effort into the hard winter. By the Shores of Silver Lake was finally published behind schedule in October of 1939, but publication of The Long Winter followed rather closely in June of 1940, only about eight months or so later. So a lot of work was happening in both novels at the same time through letters, probably causing some distraction. So let's back up a little bit in time. In August of 1938, Wilder mused to Lane that, the only way I can write is to wander along with the story, then rewrite and rearrange and change it everywhere. I have 10 chapters of the first rough, very rough draft of The Hard Winter, but you could not read them if I sent them to you. Perhaps it was partly because of that uncertainty of how to fill in enough details around the struggle against the storms that led the Wilders to go to Desmet in June of 1939 for the Old Settlers annual event. While there, she did research not only for the novel about the winter, but the rest of the Little House story too. They met with old friends and refreshed old memories. The pair had also visited Desmet in 1931, 38, and again on this trip in 39. So now let's focus in on a couple of specific episodes from The Long Winter and listen in as Wilder and Lane grappled with the work. First, the schoolhouse blizzard, which we mentioned briefly a few minutes ago in a different context. In the autobiography, this section took up a decent amount of space, so we can assume that it was an impactful event for Wilder. The children head off to school on a warm November morning, only to have the terrible blizzard winds slam into the school building. Wilder shared her memory of the event with Lane, and Lane must have written back criticizing Miss Garland, the teacher, and her brother Cap for leading the kids away from the shelter of the school building. I say must have because we don't have Rose's actual letter, but we do have Wilder's response. Wilder wrote, Rose, dearest, no, the people in the hard winter were not monsters. I haven't yet been able to get my meaning across to you. In one of those storms where it is a struggle to even breathe, one does not think much. If Cap thought at all, I suppose he thought we would come to one of the long line of buildings along Main Street, which we did. Yet the cold and the confusion of it, Cap and Miss Garland were nice, friendly, ordinary persons. I wish I could explain how I mean about the stoicism of the people. You can hear her frustration as she tried to get Rose to understand her point of view. In any event, imagine being a young teacher responsible for the lives of your students and not knowing what the right thing to do would be. It was a terrible responsibility and part of what caused such tragedies seven years later when in January of 1888, the blizzard struck that became known as the children's blizzard for the number of school children and teachers who died that day. Many people confuse that single 1888 blizzard with the entire hard winter, possibly because of this school blizzard scene within the long winter. So next, let's look at the theme of isolation and how Wilder and Lane had different visions for who should be living within the Ingalls store building throughout the winter. In the novel, the Ingalls family live alone in Pa's store building on the main street of town. In reality, George and Maggie Masters, along with their infant son, lived with the Ingalls family. 
Wilder's personal memory of them was not pleasant, so she did not want to include them. And as a side note, the Ingalls and Masters families remained friendly, so it's not entirely clear why Wilder herself felt that animosity. Regardless, rather than fighting her mother on that count, Lane switched to advocate for having Mr. and Mrs. Boast, close friends of the family, live with them instead to expand the number of characters and interactions possible within the story. In her response letter, Wilder pushed back. She mulled it over some more, she wrote about something else, and then she came back to the topic a couple of times. Finally, she fully explained why she wanted the family to live alone. She wrote, I can't have the boast living with us because if we do, Boast and his team would help haul hay and he would help twist it. He would help grind wheat, Mrs. Boast would help, and the point of the situation would be blunted. We can't have anyone living with us unless they were mean people who would not help, as the masters were, or the hardships will mostly vanish. The situation is this. Pa is alone. He must haul hay to feed the livestock and to burn. Pa hauls with one horse on a sled. It takes most of his time. He freezes his nose and nearly freezes himself. He does the chores and starts the fire in the morning and helps grind wheat at night and twists hay. Ma and I twist hay and keep up the fire. We grind wheat and get the meals and with Carrie's help do the rest of the work. Wilder won this particular argument. In the published novel, The Ingalls Family Live Alone, without Wilder having to deal with her negative memories of the Masters family, and without diluting the loneliness of the winter by bringing in the happy and fun Mr. and Mrs. Boast. Wilder wanted this book to be the Ingalls Family Against the Elements. She further wrote, people became numbed and dumb with the awfulness of these storms and terrible cold. There were only a few who kept normal and very much alive. Pa and the Wilder boys did. That youngest Wilder boy, of course, is Almanzo. So now let's look at the seed wheat run when Almanzo, along with Cap Garland, risked their lives to retrieve seed wheat from a homesteader to keep the residents of Dismet from starving. In her autobiography, this event was told over seven short paragraphs. In the novel, it was expanded to 63 pages, split into seven chapters with illustrations in a large font. From first rumor to Pa bringing in that sack of wheat through the front door. Such a dramatic episode did a great job of filling in those details Wilder was looking for and needing to add to the snow and the cold and the hunger. This is where Almanzo is the hero of the day. And for those unfamiliar with the novel, the town was running dangerously low on food. Almanzo had 60 bushels of his prize seed wheat hidden in the walls of his building, though he had shared some with Pa so that the Ingalls family wouldn't starve. But he wanted to keep the bulk of it for planting in the spring. A rumor surfaced of a homesteader somewhere southeast of town who had seed wheat that could be ground into a flour for bread. Almanzo and Cap decided to go after the wheat. This was a dangerous thing to do, considering that there was rarely more than one or two days between blizzards, and they didn't have the weather channel to tell them when the next one was coming in. In framing the hunger situation for her daughter, Wilder wrote, Manly did go after the seed wheat to feed the town so they might keep their own for the seed. Risking his life for his seed wheat, he got it before anyone went hungry. We were shorter of food than anyone later, and they gave Pop breakfast and let him have wheat. If anyone had been without food, they would have divided it. But if the town had known it was there, it would have been, there would have been a rush for it. And even those who didn't need it badly would have taken as much as anyone. As a side note, Desmet is in an area where according to the newspaper record, many of the towns had elevators overflowing with grain. There were either not enough rail cars early on to haul it away after harvest, 
or the trains couldn't get in to retrieve it. So many elevators were full of grain. What the situation was in Desmet, we simply don't know. In reminiscences written years after the fact, nearby settlers spoke of one grocery store sending sleds to Huron about 34 miles to the west and returning with food. Or of settlers to the south near Lakes Henry and Thompson who delivered ham and flour up to Mead's Hotel in Desmet multiple times throughout the winter. So some food was to be found in town, but it's unknown as to cost or quantities or even availability. In any event, it is likely that the Ingalls family were quite low on food due to their economic situation and having those three additional people living with them. This particular episode provided the perfect opportunity to leverage that nonstop snow and cold and hunger to frame this dramatic, life-threatening adventure, to heighten the tension in the story, then provide the pivot point that finally led to the end of the winter. Last, let's look at how the winter affected Pa and Ma, as we can discern in the letters. Perhaps the most poignant piece found among Wilder's correspondence with Lane had to do with the impact of the ongoing storms on her parents. Throughout the series, Pa is characterized as physically strong, calm, brave, whimsical, and a bit mischievous. Ma is portrayed as emotionally strong, patient, and usually unflappable, though several of her few outbursts do take place within this particular book. As Lane typed up Wilder's handwritten manuscript about the hard winter, she would make changes. When Wilder was reviewing the appropriately named chapter, Cold and Dark, she noticed the song lyrics she had included were missing with lyrics to a different song in their place. Wilder made notes in two separate locations. She was evidently there rose to miss it, not to cut the hymn as originally used. The original lyrics read, I will sing you a song of a beautiful land, home of the soul, where no storms ever beat on that glittering strand while the years of eternity roll. Between the two separate notes written, Wilder told Lane, don't cut the hymn, Ma sang to Grace while the blizzard raged shows she was almost hopeless of this world. A land where storms never beat would have been thought of with longing. It was a wailing tune too, the kind Ma sang when she did sing. We must show the effect the winter was having. It nearly broke Ma down when she sang of the land where there were no storms. And Pa, when he shook his fist at the wind, don't leave that out. We have shown that they were both brave. Let's show what the winter nearly did to them. No one could live through that winter, however brave, and not come that near to breaking down. And as Pa did, when he shook his fist at the wind. You may have noticed that Wilder referred to her book as the hard winter, not the long winter. Quite near publication date, the publisher objected to calling the book hard, worried that it would scare away children. They thought calling it the long winter was better. Rose wrote to her agent objecting to this change saying, if the hard winter as a title is too depressing, what is the book? Obviously the name was changed, but Rose made the topic of how children were being too coddled a recurring theme in her future writing. But as an interesting side note, it had been Rose who had worried that by the shores of Silver Lake had stories in it that were too adult or too mature. And it was Wilder who had to talk Lane into allowing these darker items. Laura herself had lived them and Laura was growing up. So the storyline had to grow up too. For herself, Wilder wrote to her agent, George By in early May, 1940, a few weeks before publication. It has been rather trying living it all over again as I did in the writing of it. And I am glad it is finished. Before we finish our talk, I wanna add one more little piece from their correspondence. 
1937, Wilder wrote to Lane to say that she'd found an old record book that Pa had kept while he was working for the railroad in 1879. She told Rose, what a pity he didn't write about the hard winter. And I wholeheartedly agree. I have very many questions for Charles Ingalls. But then again, part of the fun of research is the hunt and the sleuthing, not necessarily the solutions. So I've covered just a glancing overview of the interesting process of how Laura Ingalls Wilder turned her memories and experiences during the hard winter into her nearly perfect novel, The Long Winter, and how it compares to the historic record. I thank you and I am happy to take questions. Well, Cindy, that was that was very, very interesting. Uh, I tell you, the, the weather was just amazing back then. So, and we have a lot of questions. And if you've got um, uh, questions you want to add, pop in there. And again, vote for the ones that uh, if you really like them, because uh, we've got uh, 12 questions right now. And I imagine we're going to go through those and get some more there. So um, okay. the, one, the one that I think was interesting and it, it's got the most votes so far um let's see let me page it up here are the wilder papers at the hoover library open for viewing by anyone or only for research anyone anyone yes yeah. you yeah. you go in and and the wonderful staff hands you a little piece of paper you fill it out they give you a researcher card and then they bring out whatever you want to see yeah, it, it it really is that easy on there. I mean, just have to register and, and they'll help you. And and uh, the archivists at the Hoover uh, Library and Museum are just outstanding. Now, they unfortunately, are. one of them just retired last week, so they're a little shorthanded, but uh, uh, they'd be glad to help you. In fact, uh, you know, going into fall and winter, if you can, if you're uh, can do a drive down to West Branch, uh, I'd highly recommend it. It's probably a good time too. It's not quite as busy as during the summer when a summer and spring when a lot of researchers come on that so um so uh let's see uh Deidre asked how did this localized hard winter compare to overall weather in the midwest and to the nation during that winter the better person to answer that is um probably not online right now um she's a meteorologist out of omaha that is the weather of the hard winter is her specialty. Oh. Um, I focused in on, and her name is Barb, Bost, Barb Mays Bostead, and she's the one who, um, if you go to her Facebook group, is called the Wilder Weather. Okay. Um, she's she has wider context on the weather. Mm. Um, I focused in very specifically on this region in the newspaper record. So um, I didn't see a lot and I didn't um, seek out outside of this area. I have okay. plenty, plenty on my hands just here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I tell you, the pictures are just fascinating. Uh, we're clearing the tracks and so forth like that. Just amazing on yeah. that. So um, Kay uh, writes, what was the most interesting, surprising fact you found during your research? Oh, um, that the real, that the superintendent story, I, I had truly believed that the railroads had abandoned everybody because of how it's, how that story is told in the long winter. And um, the first thing I found was a history of the Chicago and Northwestern um, Railroad um, written by one of their officers. And in his section about the hard winter, he had a sentence that said something along the lines of, um, you know, people were hungry, but no one was al allowed to starve. And I remember being just kind of incensed. Well, you know, yeah, no thanks to you people. But then I discovered in the newspapers that the railroad companies put unending effort into shoveling and plowing and supplying fuel, trying to get food west on, even if it was just sleds, um, 
And really, it all kind of came to naught, aside from the fact that people didn't freeze to death and people didn't starve to death. But in terms of all of that shoveling, it kind of came to naught because it was undone every time a new blizzard came through. So um, they weren't getting a lot of income in. They were pouring money into shovelers, even though there was um, a lot of volunteer shovelers. Um, running a locomotive, pushing a plow burned extra fuel when it was low, but in the towns beyond the blockades where the railroads couldn't run trains anyway, that's when they were disseminating whatever coal or wood they happened to have in their rail yard, giving that out to the residents. Um, that was probably the biggest shocker to me hmm. because it was in just stark contrast to um, Wilder's own memory. So it's not just the novel. Um, her autobiography and the letters between herself and her daughter make it very clear that, that she believed that the railroads had given up. And it's a bit of a mystery to me um, mm. as to why, because Charles went over to the store a lot to visit with the other men. And what we know about some of the other towns is the men would gather like that to read each other the newspaper articles and talk about whatever news came in off of the telegraph. And he would have been acquainted with the efforts of the railroad companies, which is where I think the superintendent story came from, because the newspapers are full of similar stories, because that kind of thing happened with every blizzard. It minus the uh, giving up part. I see. Okay, so, yeah. good. Well, uh, Sherry writes, is it true that Carrie's health never fully recovered after the hard winter? You know, it's hard to say. She was, you know, always kind of frail, but she went on to work awfully hard and she homesteaded alone and she ran newspapers all over everywhere. She did have some asthma problems. So she lived in Colorado for a while and I think Wyoming to try and find a, a cleaner air. Um, but she lived a, a pretty long, decent life. I think all the Ingalls women had uh, diabetes issues, but late, but late in life. So there were some standard health issues, but whether they were due to malnutrition during the hard winter is hard to say. Mm. So. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Kelly writes, uh, do we know how Native communities survive the weather? Did any of the newspapers include indigenous people in their reporting? Yes. Uh, yes to part two. Uh, I do not know for part one. Um, I did not find anything, and I did not seek out um, information about the indigenous communities, but Many um, articles did appear both prior to the start of the winter. Um, various towns were near like reservation areas and they all had um, um, natives who would come in and say, um, this is gonna be a tough winter. And then as the winter wore on and the snow was piling up, then they would come in and say, you're gonna have a lot of flooding. And the, it was always reported with respect and um, warning to people that, oh, we better watch out for this um, because they know what they're talking about. And so that's how it was found in the newspapers. Okay, okay. Well, uh, Jane asked, what questions would you ask Pa? Oh. <laughs> Well, if I narrow it in on the long winter, because um, I have lots of others for all the other books too, um, I would I would just want him to talk about it. You know, just pour out all the stories in whatever random way. I'd want to know, like, why did Laura think the railroad companies gave up on them? Was that part of the um, you know, that railroad settler, uncomfortable frenemy sort of relationship that was always going on. Um, you know, why did she think that? You know, it, he was the conduit for information coming in. Um, but I think he knew differently. So um, 
I would just kind of want to know anything he would be willing to share and um, his perspectives on it. And he had gone out and shoveled. What was it like? It, it, in the novel, it's kind of early on and he's really excited about it. And um, I, I can imagine it was a bit of camaraderie at the early level. But I would just want to hear his um, perspective on that entire period of time. Okay, okay. Well, uh, Maureen writes, are there any other books that document this time in history at this time? There is another book. Um, it's more of a booklet um, that somebody did that is about the hard winter of 1880, 81, and I cannot remember his name and I apologize, um, but it covers a much wider region. I think he even goes out to the East Coast, um, pulling out newspaper articles. Um, I read it after mine was published and I, I, I just cannot remember his name. Um, but there's very little, like the, the county histories, because this all started very innocently. I um, had my neighborhood book club read The Long Winter. And I, in preparation, I knew they would ask me questions about how close did it compare. And that's how I ended up going on this hunt. And it started with just finding some county history books published, you know, in the decades following the hard winter. And um, some of them, like I said, in the early part were, it was all hyperbole, you know, kind of the, oh, the blizzard started in October and it didn't stop until May and um, everybody starved to death. And, you know, it, it was all hyperbole, but no details. And then I realized that the newspaper record was going to be where I could find those details week by week as it unfolded. And um, from what I've been told from people that have talked to me and what I was seeking out, there isn't a lot that focuses on the whole long winter. It's the children's blizzard seven years later that um, there's lots and lots and lots about. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, Gail writes, and she wrote this question, actually, she sent it in at uh, a little after six o'clock when you started, and she goes, what is the problem with using newspapers for research? Ah, one of the problems and, and is, is that, well, one, errors are easy and typos are easy that can, you know, switch numbers, that kind of thing. But the biggest thing is that these new, the newspaper editors for these brand new towns one of their main jobs, whether official or unofficial, was to boost their, their town because all those new towns are competing for new residents. And so it's the newspaper publisher who takes on the, the role of making their town sound the best so yeah. that new people will come there instead of there. And so you had to be able to weed through what was real and what was, and the editorials were mostly where you would find the boosterism. Like one of my favorites, um, I meant to look it up before I got asked was, um, I think it was the editor out of Watertown, South Dakota, who said that oh, sure, we got to 32 degrees below zero. But, you know, Dakota's atmosphere is such that 32 below here feels like 20 above in Wisconsin or <laughs> New York. And you know that's not true, but that's the kind of thing they would say. And they would minimize the shortages. They would minimize the discomfort. And they would talk more about we had a literary social last week and we all had a wonderful time. But in other parts of the newspaper where they just have those short little one-liners that say so-and-so did this or came into town, that's where the more factual, you knew if it was in one of those little quick blurbs that you could probably trust that. Um, 
temperatures, you know, there weren't official weather service things yet. There were some army posts, but not widespread weather tracking. Um, people would come in and say, well, we got 28 inches out at our place last night. Um, the, the totals, the weather things are a little less um, accurate because different thermometers, depending on where they were placed, how they were made, whatever. Um, but the boosterism is the biggest problem. And then the weather measurements can be a little off. But generally what I hear that, and this comes from Dr. Barb too, I think it's around 14 to 15 feet of um, snow on the ground for the, you know, at the normal amounts of, you know, at normal time. Okay. Uh, as it would settle and all of that. Okay. Well, uh, Edwina writes, uh, as far as I can remember, the telling of the seed wheat trip is the only time the narrative jumps away from Laura's experience slash perspective, apart from the farmer boy and discounting where characters are recounting stories to Laura. Is that right? And then is there any evidence from the letters whose idea the kind of split screen narrative device was, Laura's or Rose's? Ah, yes, I do believe that is the only time that the narrative switches. Um, and I don't remember if I came across that um, because it wasn't something I was looking for or that caught my interest. Um, but it might be out there now. I'm gonna have to look. I've, I've got all the letters. I'm 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 gonna have to look. <laughs> yeah. Well, good. Well, this kind of dovetails into uh, uh, just this was a, not a question, but just a statement from Mylene. And she goes, I have researched over there. I assume she means at the Hoover Library. Didn't realize how many boxes there were of papers. <laughs> There's a lot. There's yeah. a lot. So even yeah, being there um, for multiple days, you still have to winnow down which yeah. boxes to prioritize because you think, oh, I can see them all. No, you cannot see them all you, unless you move in for a while. There's a lot. Yeah. The uh, the inter interesting thing too is, is the most checked out uh, research material is on Laura Ingalls Wilder, not Herbert Hoover. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that tells you how popular the subject is. Well, Rachel writes, what were the complications mentioned? Oh, well, the complications mentioned were the, the boosterism that, that came in. Okay. And so um, trying to see through the veneer of everything's good here, you know, <laughs> you know nothing to see here, everything's fine. Um, <laughs> editorials of the, um, of the editors, essentially, um, trying to minimize. And some of them would get really, really upset because, um, you know, residents would write letters home to family. And then those letters would end up in Eastern newspapers. And as we know from the Laura books, people back East, um, just the very idea of people from back East saying anything bad about out West got everybody's dander up. And, and there were a couple of the editors in particular who just if, if you wanted to set them off, you would just say, hey, you know, the paper in Boston said that, you know, everybody starved to death out here. And then they would go on these multi-column diatribes. And when you would think about how much work it was to typeset even a single sentence, and they'd go on for pages and pages of just, you know, very similar to the 32 below feels like 20 above in other parts of the country um, <laughs> kind of humorous um, both entertaining and um, you wonder how it was received did people read that and see through it or um, did some poor soul come out thinking that it was going to be you know, winters were going to be balmy out here. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're running up. Uh, we're we're going to have our last question for you on this. And this comes from Samantha. 
What do you do when you're not writing slash researching? I'm training to be a librarian and I want to be like you when I grow up. No, <laughs> thank you. I read a lot. Um, in fact, ordinarily at any one time, I have three or four books I'm reading, depending on what room I'm in. Um, I hike and I bike and um, I, I do all kinds of our architecture. I'm, I also lead in the city, Iowa. And so I'm on a, a committee under a board related to that. So I do um, newsletter and membership development for Frank Lloyd Wright organization. Um, I keep myself busy and I have a second manuscript that's in the hands of the editor right now. And uh, so I'll be kicking up with that pretty soon here too. Oh, what, and what subject is that, Cindy? Is... Oh, okay, okay. Uh, well, again, thank you so much. We had, I think you answered 16 questions. We got 17 still open, but we could be here all night. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, we're going to have to stop. But again, thank you so much uh, thank for you. Uh, taking time out to talk with us tonight. And uh, we'll have to have you back to West Branch in person soon. Hopefully, you'll be able to start having things in person. Yep. Yeah, that will be nice. Well, great. Again, well, that's all the time we have for questions now. And I'd like to thank uh, Cindy just for her insights tonight. And also all the public libraries uh, who joined in as well. We had uh, a, a very, very large crowd uh, on hand here tonight. I think I, I looked at one time, it was like over 175 people. So again, thank you so much. Remember, the Presidential Library is now open seven days a week from nine to five and I invite you to visit a new temporary exhibit now open called Deliverance, America and the Famine in Soviet Russia, 1921 to 1923 featuring accounts of numerous humanitarian efforts by Herbert Hoover and the ARA as they worked to feed 11 million people a day 100 years ago. And if you know present day what's going on with Ukraine and Russia and read this, it's just uh, mind boggling. You'd find it very interesting. And don't forget to join us October 20th for our next Third Thursday program, where we'll hear from author and historian Paul Jewell. Again, we invite you to get your tickets before they sell out for the celebration banquet featuring President George W. Bush on October 7th. Ticket sales do end at midnight, September 20th uh, on there. That's this next Tuesday. So you can learn more at our website, hooverpresidentialfoundation.org. And the Hoover Presidential Foundation staff is ready to assist you with your membership needs or charitable gifts in support of the Hoover Campus and Museum Renovation. And you can learn more about that and even show your support at timelessvaluescampaign.org. On behalf of all of us at the Hoover Campus and the participating public libraries, we thank you for joining us tonight and look forward to your next visit at the Hoover Campus.